Salut à tous, c'est Adrien de Entreprendre dans la mode. Une petite annonce juste avant de commencer l'épisode. Je viens de lancer une newsletter hebdomadaire où je partage chaque vendredi dans ma newsletter des actus, des outils et des stratégies pour vous aider à monter votre marque. Si ça vous intéresse, inscrivez-vous sur mon site www.entreprendredanslamode.com. Bonne écoute. Hello everyone, I am Adrien Garcia and this is Entreprendre dans la mode. A podcast in which I interview fashion actors and entrepreneurs. I interview them to understand their background, their challenges and their strategies to innovate and to develop their business. This week, we are meeting with Patrick Hervel. He is the Vice President of Men's Design at Vince. In this episode, we are coming back on his pathway, from his childhood studies at Berkeley, his experience at V Magazine, the launch of his brand and his arrival at Vince. It was a pleasure to interview Patrick. I hope you will enjoy the conversation. Good morning. Everybody, um, welcome on Entreprendre dans la mode. I am today with Patrick Hervel, the Vince men's designer. Hello, Patrick. Hello. Uh, to start with, could you please uh, present yourself? So my name is Patrick Hervel. Uh, I'm the new menswear designer here at Vince. Cool. And the second question usually is, uh, could you come back on your pathway since you're the very beginning of your of your life? The to, very, uh, very today. beginning? The very, very beginning. Uh, all right. Um, <laughs> Long, how much time do we have? We've got no. around 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was born in uh, just outside of San Francisco, California. Yeah. Swedish parents, um, both of them Swedish. Uh, then we moved uh, back to Sweden, then to London, and then back to the San Francisco Bay Area. San Francisco Bay Area is really where I, you know, had my adolescence. That's really where I feel like I'm from. Mm. Um I continued to live there uh, during university. I went to UC Berkeley. Um, and then after Berkeley, uh, I moved to New York. Um, worked at magazines for a few years and then started my, my own label. And yeah, roughly, so, you know, I started kind of um, half started, maybe 2008, something like that. Yeah. Um, And then I had my own label in New York for 10 plus years and, that, and then was hired by Vince to do their menswear about a year and a half ago. All right. So and moved going, to Los Angeles. Yeah. You are going very quickly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's, uh, you need me to go into some depth yeah, on some yeah, of those points. Exactly. So yeah. uh, was it like, uh, what was your first encounter with, uh, with fashion? Hmm, that's a good question. I feel like, like many people as a, you know, a teenager in, in the suburbs, um, you know, that's, that was my first encounter with fashion. Maybe it was through music. Um, this was the mid nineties. Um, you know, suburban teenager in California, I was very into the music coming out of London at the time. So mid nineties, British music, like Brit pop, you yeah. know, I was a, a teenager And which was a little bit outside of, you know, the norm for my peers at the time. Um, but that was probably my first, first kind of entry point into fashion. And I think also a lot of the kind of, yeah, the fashion happening at the same time, but maybe also some of the fashion imagery happening at the same time. Like I think of like some of those images from the mid nineties, um, you know, by like Nick Knight, for example, um, you know, even some, some early McQueen, yeah. um, that as a, as a teenager kind of were, you know, made me stop in my tracks and, and notice something because I wasn't really interested in fashion before then. Um, you know, and then, you know, quickly after became really fascinated by Helmut Lang, kind of Helmut Lang during the, the height of his powers in the mid nineties. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Were you looking at magazine already? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, in those days, that's how, that's the main way you would consume fashion and experience fashion. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, it sounds like I'm talking about a, a long, long time ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, magazines yeah. and you would, I would be excited to see the, the latest issue of, of the face, you know, and, um, yeah, mm -hmm. like many people, you know, in yeah. my generation. Was it like uh, already when you were younger an, 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 an objective um, to build your own brand at some time? Mm, I, that happened very, very gradually. Yeah. It wasn't my track at all. Um, 
I mean, I went to UC Berkeley, which does not do, does not have a fashion sc- yeah, program. What did, what did you study there? I studied political science and economics. Yeah, uh, and then an art history minor. Um, I, you know, my track was to, or my my thought process was that I was going to join the diplomatic corps, like work for the State Department. Um, which sounded, you know, would have taken me on a different path in life, but would have been probably very interesting. Um, instead. I became a fashion designer. <laughs> What's the turning point? I, I fell into the trap of becoming yeah. a fashion designer. What, what happened? What happened? What, what went wrong? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I just, you know, I was like, it, my interests gradually sort of pulled me in other directions. You know, I, I, at my school, there was always every year a group of people, as soon as you graduated, who wanted to move to New York. Yeah. But there's no position at the time. Everybody wanted to go to New York. Yeah, well, all of my friends did. Yeah, that just felt like that—that's where you wanted to be. Um, you know, and you, the year before me, people would graduate and people would move to New York. So I already had this kind of built-in group of friends in New York. And then I finished school, and I was like, oh, but "There's nowhere I'd want to be more than New York." So well, just kind of left. New York. Yeah, yeah, just moved to New York. And what did you do first at New York? I worked for uh, Visionaire. Um, which was a kind of this art book uh, publishing company yeah. that later spawned uh, V Magazine, yeah. um, <clears throat> where I also worked, yeah. or when it first began. How did you get the job there? Um, I started as an intern there. And then, just it, uh, well, that's kind of an interesting story. So I, was, I moved to New York in 2001, in the summer of 2001, which was, of course, not, it was, you know, bad timing. So... There were, you know, shortly after September, September 11th, there was no, no one was hiring people in, in New York for a good six months. Um, but I had done this internship earlier, so they were like, oh, what, come back and work for us. So I just started working, working at V Magazine, mm-hmm. Visionaire V Magazine. Okay, and yeah. what did you learn there? I, f- I think that was an amazing place to be at that moment because it really felt like a kind of, uh, almost like a finishing school for me. I mean, um Everybody was kind of coming coming through those doors at that time. Um, you, you mean every, the, the, the photographer, person, yeah. every every stylist, um, and in a funny way, many of those people are still the people that are the photographers and stylists in our industry today. You know, a good fifteen years later, mm-hmm. which kind of speaks to how how weirdly um, static fashion can be. I mean, it's like the same people fifteen years later. Um, so no, I think it was an interesting place to be at the time. So you basically, you learn your, you make, I mean, you make the grade. I mean, you, you studied fashion there, right? What, in a way I studied fashion there. I feel like I studied how to, you know, the, the imagery surrounding fashion there. I did at the same time take classes at Parsons, which ah, is okay. the fashion school, where, you know, just very tech, technical things, which I, which I, you know, those were kind of like, um, just additional classes I did for myself. Yeah. But really I learned to be a fashion designer just by doing, I mean, to continue the story, um, while I worked at V, two friends of mine from college, Umberto and Carol, Umberto Leon, Carol Lim started the store opening ceremony, um, which at the time was just a very small store no one had heard of. Um, and I, I made some t-shirts for them when they opened their store. So that's really the beginnings of... With the, with the label Patrick Hervel. Yeah, that was, that's the beginning of me being a fashion designer, having a, a label. Very, very simple, very natural, you know, really just the most simple thing was printed yeah. t-shirts. Do you remember what kind of uh, What print? it was? Yeah. It was a, uh, it was a white t-shirt with a very, very faint photo, like photographic image of the face of a marble sculpture and there was a series of them. So it's a very faintly printed um, marble sculpture faces on large format covering the whole front of the t-shirt. So was it kind it of disappeared well? yeah. into the background. Uh, and, there, and there was maybe four of them. They were very beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I think I have one in, in a closet somewhere. Right. Okay. So you stayed at face at v, uh, Visionaire, sorry, mm-hmm. for around three to four years? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And what's the turning point? Well, I think I, I think at the end maybe I was. F- I think I might have been fired at the end. <laughs> to be honest, I think it was a, I was uh, because I had started doing my line basically, yeah. and I was I would you know I would I was busy doing that, you know, I, and I would kind of be in and out of the office. Eventually, more out of the office. 
Benin. And then it, I don't remember exactly how it ended, but it just ended. Yeah. So. Um, and then I was doing that full time. Yeah. All right. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the different milestone of uh, the Patrick Carvel brand? Uh, what was the the most important moment in the in the, mm. the ten years? So yeah, existence? I mean, I, I, I mentioned I started in a very sort of small, organic way um, <clears throat> with opening ceremony. It wasn't maybe f until three or four years later that I had a full collection, you know, all the components of a collection, um, and that really was also like a learning period for me to build build those pieces into it gradually, those different categories. Um, then I started doing shows in New York. Which was, um, I don't know, kind of a thrill, and it felt kind of. I just dove dove into it, um, and I always felt like that was kind of. Um, there were some, you know, a, a series of, of kind of. Those were amazing moments, um, you know. To do, you know, I I remember being so kind of like emotionally <clears throat> involved in doing putting doing the collection and doing the show that I would almost get like kind of postpartum. Uh, depression after, like I would almost like I had given birth to something each yeah. time, which is I, which got less and less over time. But um, yeah, I was like so deeply involved emotionally in doing each each collection, um, which I think is true of a lot of a lot of like designers that you get so kind of yeah, it's, you make these you make a baby yeah. each time. Uh, it's a strange way of, of looking at it, but it's kind of true. Um, I mean, what, a, you know, then I sort of started to be nominated pretty regularly for, um, you know, New York, they have the CFDA award or whatever, um, which is kind of like, um, yeah, it's like, a, it's like Vogue affiliated thing that they do put on, um, you know, and, you know, became kind of a regular of doing shows in New York and, mm -hmm. and being involved in that, that world. Yeah. And what was the vision at the very beginning? I was, I mean, I, I think working at the magazine also left me kind of frustrated in a way because there were so many moments there where there were, I would sit through meetings of people pulling out references to things. Um, you know, the easy references that are still used in fashion. Like it's, you know, a bit this and a bit that, but kind of like 70s, but also a bit like this, which to, uh, over time just becomes a, you start to recycle references and references on top of references. Um, I wanted to try to create an aesthetic that was reference free, um, you know, which then what does that mean? It means you have to lean much more heavily on innovation in materials um, even technology, um, new silhouettes, which of course in menswear is the most difficult thing, um, because it still has to function as menswear. Mm. So it's a very, very narrow path to walk, but that was, that was my goal. Mm. Um, and to do something that felt completely, completely new each time. Um, that was my goal. Mm. Yeah. Which is, you know, a very challenging thing. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit of the um, creative process of uh, what was it, what mm -hmm. was it at the time? Uh, because you didn't go through a, a, a fashion school, so you didn't yeah. have any. So I, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know any, I didn't have any like rules because I'd never gone to fashion school and I'd never worked for anybody. Yeah. So really, I was just it was I was kind of uh, you know experimenting on my own. I would usually start with with a kind of central kind of material. Um, like a material innovation, something that felt completely new to me or felt like, you know, um, almost shockingly new. Um, there was one collection where I put um, iron filings on cotton fabric and wet it and let it rust over the course of two or three weeks and then washed the iron filings off and made this incredible rust stain mm -hmm. on several yards of fabric, which was then used as the basis for, for this, this kind of rust stain motif in the collection. Uh, I did the same thing with copper, which of course leaves like a green stain. I mean, these are things that are, of course have no, there's no way you could ever produce. It doesn't make any sense as a product, but it looked very beautiful and felt shockingly new to me. And, and it, what it looks incredible in person. It's like a hand dyed, you know, artisanal yeah. thing. Um, 
Which is the kind of thing you do, you can only do when you're young because you don't, you don't know that don't it's know like, yeah. that's, that's an impossible thing to ever produce. Um, yeah. And yeah. To what extent it, this, uh, this way of doing evolved today? How does it evolve for me? Yeah. I mean, you know, that again, like I said, it's something you can do when you're young, when you don't necessarily have to answer to, you know, the market. You know, ter- turning it into a business was was the, was not uh, my main focus. Um, of course, you you get a little bit older, and you start <laughs> to see the world in a more real way. And then you, but you know, you do have. I do think like the end goal is the same, which is to make a beautiful product. Mm-hmm. Um, just the rules are slightly different. Yeah, great. And business wise, um, what what? How did you learn? Um, I mean, I, I mean, I was I because was, you were by yourself. Yeah, right? I was by myself. I mean, I always kind of looked, uh, you know, at the, when I left when I left to go to to Vince, it, which was something I would like. I was looking to do for several years, just looking for the right partner and the right place to go to. Um, but I kind of remember thinking at the time like remembering the sort of my peers when I started my company that none of them were still, you know, designing or still had companies. So in a funny way I had outlasted and outlived almost all of them. Um, you know, it's a tricky thing. It's starting a company like that. That's a very, has a specific point of view, independent company, very tricky for that to last. Mm. Um, but I feel personally like my, um, I feel more creative and I feel actually more, f- more free to do things now that I have, that I'm in a much more corporate setting because I have the resources to. Mm. Um, so in a funny way, even though the project is very different, it's actually in a way more free for me because I, yeah, I have a, a team around me and I have the resources and I can, yeah, to, to, you know, the focus is, is developing a beautiful product, which was always my focus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just to, to finish on Patrick Hervel uh, brand, um, what were the, the different milestones of the, of the, of the past 10 years? Mm, what else? What else? You know, it's, yeah, I mean, just, it's a tricky thing because you, in that, that fashion cycle is like, it's, it's relentless. Like you do, it's, you do, you have an amazing show. Okay, great. Now do it again in six months. You know, so it's it is kind of back to back for ten years. I mean, hmm. That's what, yeah, hard to answer. Yeah, right. there were there are a lot of amazing moments. Yeah, yeah. And what would you do differently? What would I have done differently? What will you do? Yeah. Oh, are uh, you mean you, going yeah, forward? If, if you could, if you could start, if you could restart your your fashion mm. designer career now, what would you know. do? I don't know. I don't know that I would have done things that that differently. To be honest, yeah, not sure. Yeah. That's a good. I mean, it's a it's an interesting thought experiment. No, I don't have any regrets about that. I feel like I I did everything that I wanted to do, and I had no 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 boundaries and no one telling me no. And I could I I any I was completely emotionally invested in pouring everything into this thing each time. Yeah. Which is actually a very rare thing. Um, and I did that for like over 10 years. And I actually, it's actually very useful for me now being in a much more sort of cor- you know, corporate setting. Yeah. A lot of that, I've gotten it out of my system. Mm. A lot of that kind of, oh, I want to say this and like do, you know, I, I've, I've, I've done, I did that. Yeah. Um, so in a funny way, it's left me, I think, well prepared for uh, to do other things. Yeah, I do. Th- I mean, being a kind of a gun for hire now, uh, working for another brand is also deeply satisfying for me. So great. So tell us, um, can you tell us how, how it happens uh, this Vince collaboration? <clears throat> so it's it was a conversation that started maybe a year and a half before, two years before I was actually hired. Yeah, I mean, Vince is and a it's company. It's been a very long process. Hmm? It's been a long process. Yeah, long process. But it's a, you know, like anything like this, it's a conversation mm. that happens. There are different people that are part of the conversation at different times, and some of those people, you know, change over time. Um, but it, you know, it kind of 
gradually just started to feel like a very natural, <clears throat> a natural thing for me. And, you know, part of it is also this, this going back home in a way, LA was never my home, but California was mm-hmm. my home. Um, and I did see Vince as having this very unique place in the market as being the only luxury brand coming out of California. Yeah. So, which is in a funny way, something that hasn't been, you know, everything in fashion has been explored, but somehow there is this strange position that Vince is in that I feel like is kind of something it can, Vince can chart out a path on its own. Um, and that is this kind of this, this luxury perspective from California, mm. which is a very specific thing. Um, and it's a thing I, I feel like I understand deeply because I'm from there. It does have its own rules of dressing, its own codes. Um, so it is a kind of, it is a specific point of view that hasn't been explored. And mm-hmm. that, that was really one of the central reasons for me why Vince was an interesting place to land. Yeah. So what did you start with? <clears throat> I mean, I started with the basic building blocks of the brand, um, which um, sweaters was, re- was really yeah. kind of what Vince, when, what Vince had been known for when it, when it started, cashmere specifically. Um, you know, it had a very kind of pretty neutral, um, neutral building blocks, um, which are usually the best building blocks. Yeah. You know, they're... Um, not terribly specific, um, but there was a, this general sense of ease uh, and a kind of relaxed informality mm. combined with luxury, yeah. which to, is kind of a specific thing. Yeah, maybe to to put things into perspective, could you just uh, uh, explain us where does Vince come from? Mm-hmm. The, the, a quick history of the of the brand, uh, Vince. Was founded in 2002, um, and it started. Re- yeah, it started really as a focus on sweaters. Um, was always based in the design studio. Was always in LA, so there was always this kind of this kind of you know this kind of tension of a cashmere sweater company coming from Los Angeles. That's really its its origin point, um, and you know, and from there it kind of. It kind of it continued. Um, it had some some highs and lows along the way, and um, I was Caroline, who's who's uh, works on the women's side, is was brought in a, what a year and a half before me, something like that, um, and then she hired me on the men's side. Um, yeah, and it's you know there you know we like I said there was a kind of neutral sort of base but a beautiful base to build on which is this kind of luxury perspective mm. from California that was yeah relaxed and easy yeah and personally because you you moved from uh, from uh, uh, your company a small company where you were doing everything mm. from uh, from mm-hmm. sales everything. to design to yeah. everything yeah to uh, um, to such a big brand mm. uh, with a big team mm-hmm. around you, um, how do you manage this? I mean, for me, it's it's um, it's. I mean, the the my my previous job when it comes to that was much more difficult. This is you know I'm <clears throat> I don't know I I feel like I've had this secret skill this whole time of I, I think I'm actually pretty good in a corporate setting. Um, which I'd never, it was a skill I'd never used before because it was just, I was in just my own sort of silo before with my small company, uh, with my small team where I, you know, I'd have to work very intensely with, with, you know, 10 people. Um, it actually has left me very well suited for this kind of much bigger corporate job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, what's the vision for Vince for? Yeah, I mean, it's it is it is kind of really leaning into and exploring that it's it's unique position. Um, you know, California can also be a, kind of a cliche. Like, there's like it's ten easy cliches about California yeah. that are that we all know. But I do think that it's that's kind of a misunderstanding of California. Um, and I think that there's a there is something much. I don't know, much more elegant 
um, and refined um, that in that that hasn't really been explored and really isn't part of those that stu- that those cliches that we all know. I mean, I think of where I where I grew up in San Francisco Bay Area, the codes of dressing there. Um, you know, that's a place where you know the captains of industry, the 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 um, you know the the Steve Jobs of the world. None of them are wearing suits. Um, but at the same time, there is a kind of formality and a kind of uniform to the way people dress there. Um, and it, you know, there is something that isn't explored. And that's really what I want to hone in on are these kind of these moments of a California aesthetic in its most elevated and most refined form. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, how do you nourish yourself? Mm. Um, I mean, I'm still <clears throat> relatively new to Los Angeles, even though I've lived there now for over a year. So, I mean, it's it's kind of an amazing city and an amazing region and California in general. Um, I feel like California has never felt more like the future than it does today. Um, and that's an exciting place to be and an, an exciting time to be there. Um I mean, I think there's so much to explore there. Um, so, you know, in my time off there, weekends, whatever, there's so much, I think there's so much kind of to dip into and explore and experience for the first time. Yeah. What kind of, what are you doing over the weekend? <laughs> uh, on the weekend? I mean, I'm just thinking like, I don't know about the, it's specifically, the, it's going to sound boring if I told yeah. you. But there have been moments in where I've been kind of um, in awe since I moved to, since I moved to Los Angeles, um, they're like driving home at night. I sometimes I have a convertible now since I moved to LA driving home at night <laughs> with a, with this sounds Imagine silly, you, yeah. but it's, you know, I moved to LA, I might as well. Yeah. Um, one night there was driving home. There was a, because there's there, there every few months there will be a, a spectacular rocket launch from the <laughs> van. It sounds insane. But it's from Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is these SpaceX rockets being launched that, you know, the Elon Musk rocket company. And you see them in the sky. I mean, it looks like something. First, it's shocking because you don't know what's happening, almost frightening, because you see something glowing in the sky that turns into a glowing cloud and it like disappears into the, you know, into the sky. But then you realize it's a rocket launch going into space, which is, of course, kind of like something shockingly new. But it's breathtaking and so, and so incredible. I don't know. There are moments like that that where you suddenly suddenly realize that you're in going to the future. Well, in a way, but in like the most beautiful poetic way imaginable. Um, I don't know. Those, there there are moments in LA and in California today where that that I that yeah that inspire awe in a way. Yeah. Great. Um, what's your your point of view right now on the on the menswear uh, fashion industry. I was just talking about that last night. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess being I have, should give a dipl- diplomatic answer, but um, it seems very like a very noisy time. Yeah. Very noisy. Uh, just a lot, bunch of stuff, a lot of stuff. Um, which I, in a funny way, because now I'm at a brand that doesn't doesn't necessarily participate in fashion in that way, which to me feels like an incredible relief, because it just seems like so noisy and so much stuff uh, in a way that isn't to me inspiring. Um, but I do also think that when there is a this sort of incredibly noisy, uh, disorganized moment that there's always a sort of a more focused, quiet space that opens up on the exact opposite side of it, which is exactly how fashion always works. There's a, you know, a reaction one way, and then there's a, a always a space that opens up on the opposite side. And I think that Vince f- finds itself sitting exactly in that space, in a way. Um, it is much more about, it's a bit more quiet, a bit more refined. It's much more about, 
the brand's own aesthetic. Um, yeah. And so I actually think that it's, it's, it is, it will serve the brand well for the next, for what's to come in a way. Um, right now I've got a, a little obsession is the sustainability. Um, for you, what should the most sustainable brand should look like? Mm, I mean, that's a good question. Again, I think of our, our neighbor um, in California, Patagonia. Which is probably the most sustainable brand. Were you wearing a Patagonia jacket yes, when you walked in? Yeah, Patagonia jacket. Um, that's probably the most sustainable brand and the best model uh, in everything they do. Um, you know, that's a very tricky thing um, to follow for other brands. But I do think, you know, if you can't be sustainable in the way that Patagonia is, another way to look at it is don't make clothes that you will feel embarrassed to wear six months from now or that you want to throw away six months from now. Mm. That's that in and of itself, in and of itself is sustainability. Yeah. So I would say that's, that's, you know, that's Vince, Vince's approach yeah. to that conversation. And you personally, if you, if you, if you could, if you launch, if you had the opportunity to launch, um, Patrick Carvel today, mm. uh, in terms of sustainability, what would you do? I would say that's my answer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, usually I ask some question, uh, redundant question in my interviews. Mm. Um, who impressed you right now in the industry? In, in the fashion industry? Yeah. That's a, I wish I had had this. In a, I wish I'd had this question in advance. So I had time to think of it. God, what? That's a good question. I don't know how to answer that. I'd have to give that some thought and come back to you. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just since we were just talking about it, Patagonia, but that's not fashion industry. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have an answer for that. Yeah, but it's product industry. Yeah, I mean, it's cl clothing industry. Clothing industry. Yeah. yeah. What drives you? I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, th I always think that when, as I, as, as I've sort of you know, have gone through my career as a fashion designer in New York, you do sort of get a bit burnt out with sort of churning out novelties, you know, which is essentially what fashion is. Like you're asked to churn out novelties every six months. Um, I guess trying to figure out other ways of approaching this where it doesn't revolve around that. Of course, that that's a tricky thing, but I think that You know, I talked before about just focusing on product and quality. I mean, I, that that's that's um, inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. What do you? What book do you recommend? Mm, that's a good one. <laughs> I wish I had these in advance. <laughs> what book do I recommend? Uh, maybe what book do you? Oh, uh, you know what book I always loved, yeah. and this is this is gonna make me sound like a like a nerd, but it's a science fiction book called Dune. Did you ever read that one? No. It it was made into a movie by David Lynch in the '80s, and it's being remade. I just read by that guy, that Villeneuve guy who made the last Blade Runner. It's a science science fiction book mm. um, that I always loved. Um, how do you reinvent yourself? I mean, um, how do you reinvent yourself? I mean, I think cities have, I think cities are a useful way to reinvent yourself. Having, having chapters of your life that correspond to specific cities. You know, I had a New York chapter that was, you know, a pretty long New York chapter. And now I have an LA chapter. Um, and I do think that that lends itself to, yeah, a kind of subtle reinvention each time right. for sure. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and, uh, good luck for the future. Yeah. Thank you so much. Take care. All bye right. bye. Bye bye. Thank you for listening. If you are still here, it's maybe because you liked the episode. Please leave a message on my guest social media and thanks them. It's very important. Secondly, please leave me a comment on Apple Podcasts or iTunes and rate the podcast five stars. It helps new people to find my podcast and it is very motivating. And last but not least, to not miss any news from me, you can follow me on Instagram searching Entreprendre dans la mode. Thanks for your support and see you next week.